All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our special presentation looking at Dr. Cecil Belfield Clark and the book Black Poppies and a bit about black doctors in general in World War I. Our speaker for today is Stephen Bourne, the author of at least 25 books, 25 books on African, Caribbean, British history. Um, he'll be speaking for roughly maybe half an hour to 40, 40 minutes or so, giving you some details about this background to Dr. Cecil Belfield Clark and Black History in general. And then we'll take a couple of questions and also hear a bit about the plaque unveiling for Dr. Cecil Belfield Clark, which will be taking place on Wednesday, the 12th of April in the Elephant and Castle area. But without further ado, I'll hand you over to Stephen Bourne. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Tony, and uh, thank you everyone who's signed in. Uh, I, I welcome this opportunity to explain a little bit about my latest book, which is the children's version, the young reader's version of Black Poppies. As Tony says, I've been writing Black British history books for a very long time, 32 years now. Um, not quite 25 Black history books, but near enough. <laughs> uh, and the one that seems to have really captured people's attention and is greatly loved and, and read a lot is, is Black Poppies, which was originally published in 2014, so that's almost 10 years ago now, did so well that uh, a second edition was published um, with a revised edition, a new edition in 2019, five years later, because so many people came to me with stories and, and rare photographs. And then in the meantime, many uh, parents of primary school children and teachers of, of primary school children came to me and said, would you adapt it for primary schools uh, for eight to 12 year olds? Although I don't think it should be restricted to that age group. Anyone from six to 96 can read it. And so that's how the new version of Black Poppies, uh, the story of Britain's black community in the First World War, was published last October and launched last October for Black History Month. And it's doing really well. It's filling a, a gap, a, a, a gap that should not be there, but there is a gap, I'm afraid to say, in the publication, the commissioning and publication of Black British history books for children, for younger readers. Um, and I'm glad to, to have been one of the first to attempt to do this. But obviously there was David Olashoga adapted his book, Black and British for Young Readers. Um, an author, a celebrity author who shall remain nameless has also published a book and has left out Dr. Howard Moody. They all seem to leave out Dr. Howard Moody, which to me is like writing a book about African-Americans from history and leaving out Dr. Martin Luther King. Anyway, I've got that off my chest, but Dr. Howard Moody is in some of my books, including this new one. But we'll start with the first chapter in the book. Uh, this is the children's version, but it's still of, of interest to, to, to anyone of any age. Is my adopted Aunt Esther, who was born just before the First World War, 1912, the first sure many of you know, began in 1914. So Esther was just a little toddler when the war broke out. Her father, as you can see in the photograph, her father Joseph Bruce was from Guyana. He was a merchant seaman who married uh, a British woman and settled in London, in West London, Fulham, and that's where Aunt Esther was born in 1912. And the first chapter in the book really brings together all the little stories she told me about her memories, her childhood memories of the First World War. So the book is about, primarily about the Black servicemen and the wider Black community in Britain um, in the First World War. And But I didn't want to exclude women and children, so where I could find stories, I would include them. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and one of the many stories Aunt Esther told me about her early childhood, and I'm not making this up, I've no reason to, was the Zeppelin. The Zeppelin was an airship sent by the Germans uh, to drop bombs on British cities and, and seaside towns. It did a lot of damage and killed a lot of people. Not many people realised that during the First World War, the Germans did bomb uh, this country. And Aunt Esther told me that this Zeppelin came over 
her street in Fulham and and the neighbours all ran out to look at it. They didn't really know what it was at that time. They didn't realise that it could have dropped bombs on them. And she said it was quite a sight to see, as you can see from the picture in, with Aunt Esther and her father, uh, must have been terrifying if you knew what it was there for. But she said it was a, it was an odd thing to see in the sky, but fortunately didn't drop any bombs on Aunt Esther and her father. Um, her mother, her white mother, sadly died in 1918 during the terrible flu epidemic. Um, and her father continued to raise her as a single father in this predominantly white working class community. And that became many years later, the subject of my first book on Esther's story in 1991. Perhaps the best known black soldier of the First World War is Walter Tull, uh, born in Folkestone in 1888, uh, joined the football reg footballers regiment when the war broke out in 1914. He was already established as a famous British footballer. Um, played for Tottenham Spurs and, and was established. And up until I wrote Black Poppies in 2014, he was always claimed to be the first black British officer in the army. Um, but I quickly realized that one should never claim this black person is the first because unless we have concrete information, um, we're making a, we're doing a great disservice to Black British history, and it's and be and the recording of it. And so I realized when I started doing my book that the other Black or mixed race men, mainly born in this country, had become officers before Walter Tull in very small numbers. But Walter Tull, as I'm sure many of you know, survived until the end of almost the end of the First World War, but was killed in action. Um, in 1918, when he was still a young man. Um, but his story had become better known by the time I wrote Black Poppy. So I said to my publisher, I don't just want to focus on Walter Tull. I want to give him a context because no one had really given him a context up till then. A context meaning other black soldiers in the British army, including Norman Manley, who's the soldier at the side of I'm not very good with my left and right, um, right hand side. Anyway, the soldier with the hat on is Norman Manley and his brother Douglas Manley, who was also known as Roy. And Norman Manley and Roy had come from Jamaica. They came from a middle class mixed race background in Jamaica. Uh, fairly well off sort of family at the time. Norman was a Rhodes scholar at Oxford University. I think Roy was in a public school in England at the time, but when the war broke out in August 1914, they both joined up. Uh, they both joined the British Army and both served all through the war. And one of the discoveries that I made, um, happy discoveries that I made, was that Norman before he, not long before he died in 1973, had left a, a written document, almost like an autobiography, but it was just focusing on his World War I experiences in the British Army. And that was published in the Jamaica Journal not long after he died in 1973. I was able to access that and find first-hand testimony. After the first edition of Black Poppy was published, I was contacted by Norman and Roy's great nephew, David, who said to me, oh, I wish I'd known you were writing this book and including them because I have all their letters, all their World War I correspondence. So, hey, 2019, when I was asked by my publisher to revise the book, I contacted David and he readily gave me um, permission to quote from some of the letters. Uh, and... So I'll, and they're very, very moving. They're like brothers in arms fighting on the side of the British. That's why I call the chapter in the book, Norman and Roy, Brothers in Arms. And the correspondence, mainly from Norman and Roy to their sister, Vera, Vera Manley. Uh, for example, when Norman served on the Western Front in France, he remembered it as an odd life. Once you had grown used to its hardships, 
quote, this is a quote from one of his letters, hard work, dull work, poor food and hard living quarters. In spite of all these things, there was a strange and fascinating irresponsibility about the life of a private soldier. Nothing in the future gave you concern. Your job was to do your job as a soldier and stay alive if you could. You blessed each other, sorry, you blessed each day. You prayed to be spared some fear raising experience like being caught in a severe German artillery barrage or a gas attack with gas shells. But that aside, to be alive was to have a future and worry about the future and um, to worry about the future had no place. Um, there's another chapter uh, after this called A Death on the Battlefield, which explains a little bit about um, Roy's tragic death. He was killed in action um, and his grave can be found uh, killed in action in 1917 and his, his grave can be found, war grave, Commonwealth war grave, can be found in Belgium. Um, the death of Roy devastated Norman, who described him as a young man who intended to make right in his career and had a fine mind and a large and generous love of life and people. Norman went on to say in this, this, this very moving letter, which moved me to tears when I read it the first time. I have never in my long life met anyone who found it so natural and habitual to get in touch with perfect strangers, people seen on the street, men and women, and to get lost in a talk in which they revealed all they could of themselves. For him, every walk in the city by himself was a potential short story taken from life. Um, so there's the photograph of the brothers with Roy's final resting place. Norman, of course, as I'm sure some of you know, went on to become the first prime minister of independent Jamaica when it was given its independence after the Second World and one of the things that, that I discovered about black soldiers in the First World War was that although some recruiting officers were informed by the military to discourage them from joining up, many black British-born soldiers joined the British Army because recruiting officers either didn't know that they were supposed to discourage or just ignore the ruling. Somebody pointed out to me that if a black British soldier from Liverpool or Yorkshire or London or wherever um, went to a recruiting office with three of his white mates, it's going to lower the morale of his white mates if they turn the black soldier away. Um, so the officer class was a different matter altogether. Certainly black soldiers were discouraged from uh, going for promotion, although some, as we know, like Walter Tull and others, broke through. Uh, we don't know the identity of the soldiers, the group of soldiers in the photograph, the, the, the sepia-toned photograph, um, but you can see that they've been on the front line. They're tired looking, their uniforms are slightly sort of disheveled, but, you know, they're comrades in arms, they're together, they're friends, and that's what I take from that photograph. Harold Brown, we do know, is the gentleman standing in, in the other black and white photograph. And we don't know very much about him other than his World War I career, but luckily for us, after he died in 1955, he worked on the docks. In the, he was from the East End of London, served in the army in World War I, and then spent the rest of his life working on the docks in the East End. But he was born there, that was his home. Uh, but he did some of the photographs of him survived in the Imperial War Museum collection. I don't know how, but his medals, his certificates of gallantry, some, pho some photographs uh, were given to the Imperial War Museum at some point. Uh, lucky for us who do this research. And then we come to a very interesting postcard that was sent to me after the first edition of Black Pop. Black soldier in the centre of the Welsh Guards, Sergeant J. O. Hughes's squad, taken in March 1916. Again, don't when the book was first published in 2014, and again in 2019, didn't know the identity um, of, of any of these gentlemen. 
But one of the things I like about this photograph is that the black soldier is centre stage. He's not pushed out of the photograph. He's not put at the back. He's not made invisible. He's pr they're proud of him. And you know why they're proud of him? It's because after the publication of the 2019 version of Black Poppies, a black police officer in Newport in the West Country contacted me. He says, I know who he is. He's Tom Rowett. Tom Rowett, born in Britain, was a police officer who left the police in 1914 to join the Welsh Guards. He was a police officer in Wales. His name was Tom Rowett. And we have all the information about him. You know, he's on the 1939 register, um, retired. He, he, you know, it's an extraordinary story that I've told in the children's version, didn't know about it in, in the other one, but police constable Tom Rowett, born in 1895 in Workington. Um, and there they are, one of the first black police officers in Wales. He was police constable 102 in the Newport Borough Police. In 1915, Tom and his police colleagues from Newport joined the first Welsh Guards. And then there are other stories. There's Al Haji Grunchy uh, from the Gold Coast Regiment who fired the first shot for the British Army in World War I in August 1914. There's George Arthur Roberts from Trinidad who left Trinidad as a young man to join the Middlesex Regiment in 1914 and actually returned to Trinidad at some point uh, at the request of the British Army to try and drum up interest in other Trinidadians to join. Um, Arthur Roberts, that's George Arthur Roberts in the centre. Arthur Roberts, no connection, was, 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 is, is known as the Scottish Black Tommy, born in Scotland and served all through the First World War. Um, and again, a kind of miracle happened after he died. Some years after he died, he lived until he was in his 80s in a care home, I think. But after he, some years after he died, the stories in the book, uh, in an attic in a house, somebody picked up this leather, big leather case, and it was his war diaries. He kept diaries all through the First World War, photographs, including this one. And fortunately, for historians like myself, the Imperial War Museum, to their credit, bid for it when it went to auction and won the bid. So, and with the Imperial War Museum in London, when they opened their massive World War I exhibition some years ago, were there any black soldiers, servicemen represented? Afraid not. So I was one of the people, including Patrick Vernon and Arthur Torrington from the Windrush Foundation, we complained to the War Museum and said this is a disgrace. And I pointed out to them that they had this Arthur Roberts Scotland's Black Tommy collection. And so they inserted this photograph and a diary extract into it. So if you go to the world, to the Imperial War Museum in London, you have to look very closely for it because it's a very small photograph, very small diary extract you will now find them there, which is where, where they should be. And then there are other stories. There's a Dickie Barr, a sailor from Cornwall. There's William Robinson Clark, who's in the book also, uh, from Jamaica, who joined the Royal Flying Corps before it became known after the war as the Royal Air Force, another pioneer and a very brave uh, pilot as well. I, I told my publisher when I did the first edition of the book, I wanted all the black books to include women and children. So don't know who the young factory worker is in the top photograph, but she's happy, she's smiling. She's got her arms around her, her colleagues and it's a munitions factory in Bradford in 1917. You have to look very carefully for these photographs sometimes, group photographs, because if you, if you seek, you will find. Um, the bottom photograph of the, the three entertainers uh, the, the, in the middle is Mabel Mercer, who was born in Staffordshire in 1900. Mixed race, went on the stage because there are very few job opportunities for lower class or working class black or mixed race women in Britain at that time. That's not to say there weren't middle class black women in Britain at that time, because there were. And that is covered in the book 
also. But Mabel worked all through the First World War um, in music halls, entertaining the British public, entertaining the troops. And then we come to Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Um, now, Samuel Coleridge Taylor was the famous Black British Edwardian composer, um, better known now than his, his children, obviously. Um, died in 1912, so died very young. I think he was 37. His life was cut short by illness. But not many people know about his children, Avril and Hiawatha. His son Hiawatha was named after his famous composition, Hiawatha's Wedding Feast. So Hiawatha joined, as you can see, he's in a sort of army type uniform, but he actually joined the Red Cross and, and served as a Red Cross um, officer during, during the First World War. And his daughter Avril, uh, studied music and became a composer and conductor, just like her father, uh, one of the few women to break into that world, a uh, very hard for a woman to break into that world of classical music, but because she had the Coleridge Taylor surname, um, so the, her story, her early story and Hiawatha's story from the First World War are included in the book. But I've continued to do research on Avril, particularly because she's um, so missing from the history books and shouldn't be, because she died at the age of, I think she was 98. She was lived to a great age, but there was no recognition of her um, at all during her lifetime. And even when she died, hardly at any uh, obituaries. I don't think any obituaries appeared. It's absolutely shocking. But I've done lots of research on Avril, and she was a very important woman composer of her generation. Should be better known. And then we finally come to community leaders: John Archer, the gentleman with the moustache, um, born in Liverpool, uh, became quite an important, and influential black community leader and figure, particularly at the end of the First World War, when he was the first president of the newly founded, in 1918, uh, African Progress Union, uh, which was a, one of the very first political organisations for Black people in Britain. John Archer, uh, also the mayor of Battersea, uh, he held office um, and was a very popular figure in his community. And then there's Dr. Howard Moody, the gentleman wearing the glasses, who 13 years after John Archer founded the League of Coloured Peoples. So Dr. Howard Moody was based in Peckham in South London. Dr. Howard Moody was a very popular doctor with the working classes of Peckham and the Old Kent Road sort of area. That was his catchment area. But he also had a parallel life as a community leader. People would turn to black people, would turn to him for help and advice when they needed it. And that and soldiers during the black soldiers during the First World War, uh, because Harold um, came here in 1904, so he was established as a doctor some years later and established as a, as a figurehead in the community. And it started with black soldiers going to him in the First World War if they had issues or problems racism or accommodation or, or whatever problem it was. And that eventually led to him founding the League of Colored Peoples in 1931, uh, which uh, proved to be more successful than the African Progress Union, which didn't last as long. Um, but when Dr. Howard Moody sadly died in 1947, he literally burned himself out. He, he tried to do too much, particularly during the Second World War. Um, the league didn't survive more than a few more years. I think it folded in 1951. But one of the other founder members of the League of Colour Peoples was Dr. Cecil Belfield Clark. And he's not as well known as Dr. Howard Moody, but he should be. I find it extraordinary that, that he's not as well remembered and recognised, even in amongst Black historians of Black Britain. He he's doesn't kind of make it into the history books very much. He does get mentioned from time to time. 
But there's, I think there's an, an enormous amount of research that needs to be done on Cecil Belfield Clark. Hardly any photographs exist of him. The only photographs that, apart from a few group photographs with the League of Coloured Peoples uh, taken in the 1930s, are these two pictures. One of him, I would imagine, was taken in the 1930s. The larger photograph is, was taken by Bert Hardy at the Elephant Castle, his surgery, Dr. Belfield Clark's surgery at the Elephant Castle uh, in 1949. Bert Hardy was a very well-known and respected photographer of working class people. And he went around the Elephant Castle after the war and took many photographs, including this one of Dr. Cecil Belfield Clark in his surgery. So Belfield Clark, was born in Barbados in 1894. Um, he came to England to study at Cambridge University in 1914. So he's here all through the First World War studying, studying medicine, following in the footsteps of Dr. Howard Moody. I don't know if he knew of him at that time. They certainly became friends later on when they founded the League of Coloured Peoples. But Dr. Clark opened his surgery at the Elephant Castle in 1920, and it lasted for 45 years. Can you imagine? I mean, he worked for 45 years in that surgery. He didn't live there. He lived in a house which he called Belfield House in Barnet in North London. Uh, but he kept his doors open all through the London Blitz. Now, not many people are aware that the Elephant Castle area was absolutely flattened during the London Blitz of 1940-41. The Germans targeted it, flattened it. If you ever find photographs on the internet, you can see how much devastation there was. And it was mainly working class people, poor people that lived in that area, uh, including the family and Michael Caine, the, the famous film Oscar winning film actor. He was, he, his family lived in a prefab. Uh, a, a temporary sort of accommodation at the end of the war when they were bombed out. And so Dr. Clark was well known in that community for being a doctor that anyone could go to, particularly if they had children. And this was, again, up until 1948, before the, the founding of the NHS. And he served that community brilliantly, while at the same time becoming quite um, a active campaigner for civil rights, for black civil rights. He was befriended by many African-American um, uh, men and women that worked in the political arena, including W.E.B. Du Bois, who visited him at his home in Belfield House up in North London at some point. Um, I, his surgery, by some sort of miracle, survived the bombing it, and I found because I do dig deep for information I did write about him in my book Under Fire Black Britain in Wartime 1939-45 I said in spite of the intensive bombing of the Elephant Castle and the surrounding area Dr Cecil Belfield Clark continued to work at his GP practice located at 112 Newington Causeway which is sort of between the Elephant Castle going up to London Bridge, but his surgery was almost on the Elephant Castle, which you may know if you know the area as the roundabout. And Clark worked there all through the Blitz. He had been practising as a family doctor at that address since 1920. Um, but his home was in New Barnet, which he shared with his partner, Edward Pat Walter, uh, who was entered in the 1939 Register of England and Wales as Dr. Clark's surgery assistant, secretary and housekeeper. Now, before the decriminalisation of homosexuality in 1967, many gay couples who wanted to live together managed to avoid detection and imprisonment because it was a criminal offence to be homosexual um, by pretending that one of them, usually a professional like Dr. Clark, employed the other, who was his other half, Pat. They were together for over 30 years. But the worst air raid to hit the Elephant Castle took place in May 1941, um, when the German bombers targeted the area to create a terrible firestorm. Miraculously, Dr. Clark's surgery survived, as he explained in a letter to Una Marson, who they'd obviously met in the 1930s at the League of Common Peoples, because Una 
uh, was involved with them. Um, he wrote to Una at the BBC, dated, and the letters dated the 10th of June 1941. Now, Una Marston had wanted Dr. Clark to make a broadcast about the Blitz in her series Call in the West Indies, but the bombing had caused him great distress. He asked Una Marston if he could postpone the broadcast for at least four weeks. He informed her that, even, that everything had gone in Newington Causeway except his surgery. One complete side of his building was missing with all the rooms open to the elements. And in spite of tarpaulins on the roof, rain was getting in and he was writing the letter to Una in his hat and coat. His gas and water supplies had been disconnected. In spite of this, Dr. Clark never closed his surgery. And I'm so thrilled that Newby and Jack Community Trust, uh, Jack Bueller and Tony from the Black History Books have made this blue plaque possible and as, as Tony will explain in a minute it will be unveiled next Wednesday at the site of the surgery the surgery is now gone um, the London South Bank University Perry Library building is now on that site and I'm proud to be part of that um, gathering next Wednesday I'll end there and hand you back to Tony but if you are interested you can buy black poppies from any good bookshop support your bookshops or amazon or ebay there's still lots of available uh, cecil belfield clark isn't in the book um but all the other people i've spoken about this evening thank you so much thank you all right Stephen. If, if you can stop sharing your screen then i can share mine and i'll say a few words and we'll take a few questions so if you can stop sharing your screen just oh, click on the X. He, you got oh, no, you gotta go up to that green button on the bottom uh, uh ribbon. Find the green share. button that says share screen and then say stop share. Oh, I'm so sorry. I can't find a green button at the bottom. Oh stop share. Sorry, Tony, got it. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool, no problem at all. Just give me I a write second. books, but I can't do technology. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting it in the end. All I'll, right, I'll get there in the end. I, I promise. All right, so you can have a look at the chat while I do my little talk about Black History Walk. All right, so this entire event is brought to you by Black History Walks. We organize walks, talks, and films on Black History in London every single month, all year long for the last 16 years of doing these kind of events. So there's something happening like this every month of the year for the last 16 years. We have walks all across the capital, north, east, south, and west. We also have a walk in Elephant Castle, which features Dr. Cecil Belfield Clark. Um, and we also have a walk in um, the Camden area, which talks about Dr. Harold Moody. So we've been able to put up plaques to both those amazing individuals, and the Cecil Belfield Clark plaque will be unveiled next Wednesday. These are the kind of people that come to walks. You can have, you know, your local Saturday schools, or you can have international students. You have sometimes staff groups and work groups will come for a little walk, walk about, and we do them all year long. We also have a Black History bus tour. So the top of the screen there, you should be able to see, it just about says Black History bus tour, which will be in May. So since 2019, we've been organizing three hour guided tours from a double decker. It's not a bus actually, it's a luxury coach. And it goes from Brixton to Clapham to Westminster to Hamlet, et cetera, showing you the amazing African Caribbean history that's in the streets of the capital from uh, well, central London to northwest London. And the next one's going to be the May the 27th, I think it is. And apart from doing the bus tour, we also have, this is going to work now, we also have a river cruise. So about four to six times a year, we organize a river cruise. The cruise goes from the embankment up to Vauxhall, spins around, goes on to Greenwich, and over the three hours, we give you a guided commentary from the river, uh, from the deck of the, of the boat, rather, about the history on either side of the river, but also we have people in costume on board the boat who, who tell their stories. So sometimes we have Phyllis Sweetley or Nanny or Toussaint Overture on board the boat. The next one of those will be the 27th or 28th of May. So again, it's on our website, which is just blackhistorywalks.co.uk. And we show a film. So not far from Elephant Castle, you have the Waterloo um, BFI South Bank venue. Massive cinema. That's a 458 cinema there. And we show films at that venue every month of the year for the last 16 years too. And these are the types of films that we show. 
Um, and of course, there's a link with um, several of Stephen's books in that we, we show films with black actors, black British actors from the 1940s, 50s, 60s. And we have Q&As about the film to give it more context and more kind of um, historical knowledge. So check out that. It's called the African Artists Program and it's been going for 16 years. Normally on a Saturday, once a month, we show a film plus a Q&A. And now uh, we have a book out. It's called Black History Walks Volume 1, written by some guy called Tony Warner. And this book takes two and a half of our walks um, in the Westminster Suffolk area and puts into a book form. So the book is out now. It's from Jack Miranda Books. Jack Miranda Books is a, a black female publishing house. And they published 20 books by black British authors in one year, in the year 2020, which has never been done before. Um, so if you invest in their um, publishing house, you, that means you support future black history um, books and authors. This is just a sample of one chapter. And we're looking at the comparison between black British civil rights and African-American civil rights. And this is quite unique. I think I was in this before. Um, but if you get the book, you'll see what we're talking about. We're looking at how things are similar and different in America and Britain when it comes to the fight for racial equality. These are some of the events we have coming up. We've got have about 16 events coming up shortly. And you can kind of take your pick. It could be a theater land at Black History Orchard, which of course um, links into Stephen's work well, as well, because Stephen wrote a book called, what's your book called again, Stephen? The one about theater. Oh, oh Deep Are the Roots. Thank you, yes, Deep Are the Roots, right. <laughs> so some of that walk that we have in the Piccadilly Circus, Cotton Garden area is, is, is drawn from that book. We always recommend you buy that book if you come to walk. Plus, we have walks to Trafalgar Square and Soho and Mayfair, looking at the amazing Black history in Mayfair. So if you're interested, go to our website, blackhistorywalks.co.uk, and just pick, click on either walks, talks, or films menu, and you can take your pick as to what you want to come to and check out. But we do this sort of thing all along for the last 16 years. Now, this is a kind of easy question because you've been given a few clues already. But, <laughs> but I mean, this, this man is amazing. Now imagine this is 1914. This guy comes from the end of Barbados and gets a scholarship to Cambridge. At this time, how many black students are there at Cambridge in 1914? He becomes a doctor who treated George Padmore. Of course, you do a whole talk just on George Padmore, but it shows you um, the level of respect he had that George Padmore allowed him to treat Mr. Padmore, because that's a big story by itself. W.B. Du Bois, who was an international um, star of human rights and still is a huge figure in American history, stayed with him. So they, they, they kept in touch for about 20 odd years or so. And when Du Bois came to London, he stayed with Dr. Cecil Belfield Clark. So, I mean, every single bullet point there has a whole history. And if you come on the 12th of April for the unveiling, we're gonna have a mini lecture about some of this history here. So apart from unveiling the um, plaque on the 12th of April, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, we're gonna have a, a lecture with Stephen Bourne and myself talking about some of these bullet points here. That's the picture of him that um, Stephen's referring to. And the plaque will be unveiled next Wednesday. You can just go to Eventbrite and book your free ticket and come along. And I should mention that we have the British Medical Association coming down to. So this is how well-respected Mr. Clark is to, uh, to this day in that we have the BMS going to come down. Also, I should mention that the British uh, Medical Journal will be sent to somebody as well. So you have representatives from the BMA, the BMJ, Cambridge University, London Southport University, Newman Jack, and I, I've just confirmed we're going to have um, a very high-ranking bishop from London coming along too. And we're going to have an ambassador from Barbados also um, present on the actual day. So that is just some of the stuff we'll be doing next week. Yeah. And now we're gonna take a few questions. So if you've got a question, just tap into the chat box and see, well not see, just ask the question and we'll see what Mr. Bourne will, will uh, how Mr. Bourne will answer it. So uh, if you have a question, tap into the chat box and we'll see what Mr. Bourne has to say about that question in particular. Let's take some questions now. All right, Steve, can you see there's um there's two, it seems, in the Q&A um, button, button? Yeah, I have been answering. I'd answered a couple. There's nothing, oh, new. Well, there's nothing well, new there. Do it verbally, please, because you see this is going to be recorded. And we will, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, 
So Joan asked, my step grandfather fought in World War One. He was from St. Vincent and I have no idea what he did in the war as I did not listen to his war stories. How would I found out what he did? And I said to Joan or replied, with his name, you can try and find out more by checking out the war records, World War One war records on Ancestry. I've spelt it wrong, sorry, Ancestry.com, uh, which have all the British uh, war records. And you can also try the National Archives. Um, you might find, I, I mean, I know this is going to sound, sound like a shameless plug, but my book, Black Poppies May, give you some more clues as to where to find information, but it's not easy because uh, records, um, it, it would depend on what regiment he was, that he joined. But you, if you're lucky with a name and a date of birth, the more factual information you can find out about your grandfather or any of anyone that's interested in their ancestors, make sure you have their name, their date of birth, place of birth, as accurately as you can. Um, and then Sarah asked what, did people of African descent participate in all of the wars in England, at least since the 1600s? I'm not sure how many there were. Well, my answer to Sarah was, I'm not sure how many wars there were since the 1600s, but you could start with my books, Black Poppies, about World War I and Under Fire about World War II. And, and you can find out more information about them from my website. And uh, they will give you at what I call accessible information, well researched, I hope, but accessible because I don't come from an academic background. So I don't theorize or use words ending in ology. It's I've always been uh, very much focused on first hand testimony where I can find it. But I'm not interested in the sort of academic approach. Others are and others do that kind of work better than I ever could. Um, so I won't be giving a lecture, Tony. I will be giving an illustrated talk on Wednesday. <laughs> All right. <laughs> What's your website, please, um, Stephen? www.stephenborn, Stephen with a P-H, B-O-U-R-N-E, dot co, dot U-K. Oh, and to answer your, um, Sarah's question, I think it was, um, there's definitely been black sort of since at least the Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, Going right and back. There's a, a massive history there, um, which we sometimes cover when it comes to our films. I think there's a question there about films as well, actually, Stephen, see if I can find it here. It says, um, can the films be shown online? I'm in the United States and you have such great programs. I would like the information on the Black Publishing House. Um, so Stephen, what do you know about how can people access films from, because you're a film buff, obviously. So tell us a bit about films. I don't understand the question. What, what films are we talking about? You say I mentioned them um, that the African Odyssey is probably the BFI. I think she's asking about where could she see films like that? And bear in mind, you're a film buff. Where do you get to see the films that we... Well, should... you see, this is interesting because there's so many more resources online. Uh, you've got the BFI, British Film Institute's Media Tech. Um, but they, they have actually put um, a lot of their films on their website, the British Film Institute website, had you have free, some of it's free access and some of it you have to pay for but it's mm. not expensive and they have a whole black britain film section so that needs exploring you could, i always check youtube because it's amazing how much people add to youtube not just film not just black film from britain and america and around the world but television as well i recently found to my great shock i'm a huge fan of sydney poitier but i did not know that his 1955 um television drama which was live live television it wasn't supposed to be recorded uh, a man is 10 feet tall it's a television play that he did in america um has survived it, it was recorded and a very early recording and to see the very very young um, up and coming Sydney Poitier in this play, given a, a, a brilliant uh, performance. Uh, is, so you always look out for television as well as film because you'd be surprised at how, how actually how progressive television was compared to cinema. Uh, so YouTube, um, the, the British Film Institute online website, uh, are the two main sources to find. That's what, where I look if I, if I want yeah. to. 
I know we also, also said there's a, an American website called Quelly TV. I think it's K W E L I, K W E L I, mm. Quelly TV or Quelly Tube, and they have a lot of kind of um, Af black films, often from American backgrounds. Yeah. And, and there's also Mubi, M U B I, M U B I is an online platform. They, show, they have lots of African films on M U B I. Uh, movies that's another resource you can tap into and of course definitely youtube because sometimes you find some really interesting stuff on youtube that you would never think would be there there's a there's a question from dd Dee Dee, does auntie rita have children i think she means my aunt esther she must be my aunt esther i, I assume that's who she means but no aunt esther never married and never had any children but she was always um a very open and friendly woman it, after the war she would help and support um, West Indians, particularly that came over the, the, the so-called Windrush generation. And she, she was always lending a hand to help them um, if they needed help. I mean, she wasn't a community activist or anything like that. It was nothing to do with politics. She was just an ordinary working class seamstress. She worked as a seamstress for a living, um, but she was such a friendly, outgoing person um, and British born and knew her way around in her community full of the 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 people would come to her uh if they needed advice uh Stephen um can you mention oh somebody asked about the publisher so my publisher is Jacaranda Books that's J-A-C-A-R-A-N-D-A -A -A, Jacaranda Books but they also publish your book Stephen about Evelyn Dove can you say, tell us a bit about Evelyn Dove's book and Jacaranda Publishing um yeah i'll just grab it off the shelf uh, and show the cover if, if assuming people can see me <laughs> they can see you yeah they can see you now. they can see me there's i did two books for jacaranda uh in fact they sounded me out because of the success of my copies uh valerie brandes who who runs jacaranda um asked me if i had any ideas for a book so about seven years ago now the Evelyn Dove book was published when she was um, British born, London born in 1902 of a Sierra Leonean father and an English mother from a rather well off sort of middle class background. But she studied at the Royal Academy of Music and had this amazing career on, on the stage and on television. She was a television pioneer in Britain. Um, and I actually inherited her, her archive. So Jacaranda published this, this wonderful book about her life, um, uh, Evelyn Dove, Britain's Black Cabaret Queen. And then two years later, they commissioned another book from me, War to Windrush, Black Women in Britain, 1939 to 1948. Um, and that's one of the few black women on the Empire Windrush in 1948. Mona Baptiste, who was a musician, um, and who had didn't stay in England very long. She actually had a very successful career in Germany of all places, but they loved her in Germany after the war, and that's where she stayed. So that, that's my two jacaranda books. But uh, I when, can tell you that if you do the um Parliament Mayfair Awards, we reference the Evening Dove uh, books, good. even and also if you do the the Black History and Third Line what we reference the Water Windrush book, Stephen. So we always oh, talk about yeah, well, it's it's been my life's work, and I appreciate any support um, that, that that you give. It it really is from from my heart uh, appreciated. Word of mouth, that's what sells Black History books. Mm. Uh, word of mouth, you can't rely on the Guardian <laughs> or, or anybody actually, <laughs> or anybody, <laughs> just ourselves. Spreading yeah. social media. Social media has been actually very good to to my. All book. right. Any more questions? Any more Any questions? More questions. Uh, and again, please tell us your website again, please, Stephen. www.stephenborn, all one word, dot co dot uk. All right, cool. Well, there's no more questions. So I'm going to say thanks to our audience for attending. Please check out the website, blackhistorywalks.co.uk, because we have our events on that site. And hopefully we'll see you next Wednesday, 11 o'clock at the Elephant Castle for the unveiling of the Dr. Cecil Belfield Clark plaque. Thank you very yes. much. Yes, yes, thank you, Tony. All right, ciao for now. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.